Hi everyone, Joshua Hanlon here, and today I'm at the Historic Ships in Baltimore, joined by Brian. We are going to be talking about the USS Constellation, which is this large sailing ship that you see behind me here. So we're right in downtown Baltimore pretty much here. It's not common to see a large sailing ship like this in a city. What is the, the story and history of this ship? Sure, so the ship behind me was originally built in 1854. So she is the last all-sail warship built for the U.S. Navy. So every ship after this one that the Navy had, had some sort of propulsion system in it. Steam, paddle wheels, some propellers. This one only powers on sail power. And so she represents kind of the end of an era, but also the pinnacle of 2,000 years of human ingenuity with sail ships. So everything that we knew from that tradition about how to build sailing ships went into this one. She's also the only Civil War era warship still in existence, afloat. So there are others in existence, but they're all in racks or in museums. This one's still floating. And she dates from the American Civil War period, served from 1855 until 1955. Was in commission through that time. So we like to call her or give her the nickname of a century of service. So um, during that time, she mostly served as a training ship because having no propulsion system um, in the era of steam propulsions and ironclads made her kind of a weaker warship. So she wasn't really able to be used too much for combat during the Civil War or um, post-Civil War. But being a training ship for almost 50 years, we uh, actually kept her around. So the, the glorious ships tend to serve their purpose and then they get scrapped or sold off or whatever. But a training ship sticks around. Somebody's always taking care of it. There's people working on it. And so the training ships tend to survive. <laughs> and so that's why we have her today. She's in Baltimore because her, her namesake ship, the original frigate constellation built in 1797, was built just over in Canton, Baltimore's neighborhood of Canton, in 1797. And then she was broken up in, in 1853, and this one was built and took the name and carried it until the 20th century when the aircraft carrier CV-64 USS Constellation took the name. That one's decommissioned now, so we're the only one left really in, with the name until uh, they just announced there's going to be a new class of Constellation frigates coming out in the near future, probably by 2025 or 26 was the latest we heard for the new USS Constellation. So there will be soon be four of them in existence. Yeah, that is an incredible history. And you mentioned something interesting there, that this ship is still afloat. And you can see it's obviously still in the water here yeah. in Baltimore. So talk about some of the, the ongoing work with the ship and what you have to do to it to keep it in the water like this. Sure. So. These wooden ships work, are preserved very well in salt water. So salt water does great things for wood. It keeps bacteria down, it keeps rot down. So shipwrecks are generally pretty well preserved. The wood's in good shape. The, what kills these wooden ships is fresh water. So ships like Constellation die slowly from the top down from rain. Rainwater seeps in, leaks in just like your back porch, your wooden deck in the back of your house, slowly starts to rot away from the top down. And so most of the work we do on it to keep it up happens above the waterline, luckily, because that's easy to handle as opposed <laughs> to taking it to a dry dock every couple of weeks. So um, that's where a lot of the work happens. Below the waterline, she's in pretty good shape. Uh, in fact, 48% of the ship is original to the Civil War period, uh, mostly inside lower two decks. So the further down, the more original stuff there is, which we can see when we go inside. The um, ship is floating. In fact, all the ships on our fleet float because if, uh, well, they're designed to be held up by water. Water supports them basically 180 degrees around the curve of their hull, pushing in with equal pressure on all sides. If you were to put it into a cradle or some kind of holder, then gravity is pulling the entire weight of the ship just straight down. The only thing supporting it is the bottom. So what happens is over time, ships start to pancake and they start to bulge out on the sides and eventually buckle and then become disabled. And so you either want to have it in a dry, a dry container where a pressure can be applied around all the sides. HMS Victory in Portsmouth is in a, such a thing where they, it's in a dry dock, but it has these iron pistons all around the bottom of the hull that can exert pressure or let it off to keep the ship in shape. Um, that's a lot of maintenance, a lot of work, and it's expensive. It's a lot more expensive than just sitting in the water. So um, staying in the water is a pretty good shape, um, keeps it in pretty good shape. Uh, our steel ships is a different story. We can talk about that when we get over there to the steel ships. Um, but this one's in pretty good shape from the water line down. We must have to worry about it from the top up. So we have some full-time maintenance staff that work on here, some carpenters and a professional rigger that 
mostly take care of the upper half. And everything else down is we pretty much just keep the paint fresh and it stays pretty good. How many, how many men would have served on this ship when it was active? So she had a crew of 320. And that requires 14 men per gun in order to actually fight during a combat situation, plus your men in the tops, plus your men on the ground or on the deck to turn the sails and catch wind. Because we not only have to be able to shoot, we have to be able to maneuver. So we have the whole maneuvering crew up there, which is about half of them. And then 14 men times 10 guns in a battery. That's 140 right there. So uh, the other half of the crew is working the guns. So 320. There we go. Well, we'll go on board now and take a closer look at the areas that those men worked in. We made it on board now. We're next to the bell here. So what can you tell us about this part of the ship? Sure, so we're on the uppermost deck. This, this is the spar deck. Uh, Constellation has four decks. Um, the gun deck, berth deck, and the orlops and hold, which are kind of one space. So this whole area up here is where the crew would be working during the day to keep the ship on course and to sail her. So this is kind of the main working deck of the ship. And the bell here is how the ship marks time. So this is, by the time of the Constellation, this is more of a tradition than a practicality. Um, prior to the invention of a reliable clock that could withstand the conditions at sea, they used hourglasses, little half hourglasses, a sand glass, and they would turn them over every half hour and give the bell one ring for every half hour. And once it rang eight times, that meant four hours had passed, and that was the length of a work shift called a watch. So after eight rings of the bell, everybody would change shifts and they'd start over again, counting up to four. So you do that three times in a 12 hour period and there's three work shifts. So <clears throat> by the time of the Civil War, they had some reliable clocks that could be used that would be much more accurate than a sand glass. But the tradition and the, the Navy had gotten used to hearing the bell ring and having everybody function off of that. So bells are still found on modern ships today and they still ring. Today they're over loudspeakers <laughs> and um, one MC systems but it's still tradition. One of the things that you'll notice as we move through our fleet is some of the things even from this period last all the way through because it's traditional. The Navy's real big on tradition. So here on the spar deck is where we have our yards and our masts and sails. So Constellation is ship rigged. And what that means is that we have three masts which are all square rigged, meaning they are square or perpendicular to the midship line of the vessel. So not all ships are ship rigged. You can have ships that have seven masts that are all fore and aft rigged. That's still a schooner, um, just like uh, a ship with one mast with a fore and aft rig sail is also a schooner. So it just depends on the kind of rig you have. Um, honestly, I think it's kind of funny how many different names there are. It's like somebody <laughs> was just bored and came up with names. But it does make a difference when we see a strange ship on the horizon. We're not sure if it's an enemy or not. In our case, this ship was chasing pirates and slave crews in the Atlantic. So. Um, if we're looking for a particular vessel, we know that it's a bark, for example. If we see a ring on the horizon, it's not a bark. We know that's not the one we're looking for. So there is some practicality to pointing that out. If you look aft towards the ship, you can see the full length of the ship. She's 179 feet long on deck, about 41 feet wide, which makes us a couple of feet longer and about a foot wider than our predecessor, the frigate, which was a sister ship to the Constitution up in Boston. So we're a little bit bigger but we are a sloop of war. That means all of our guns are on one deck. So we're actually considered a smaller ship than Constitution, even though we're a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. And that's because when we're talking warship size, you're talking about how many guns there are. And we have fewer guns that makes us smaller because we can punch less hard than a bigger ship can. The priority is how much firepower yeah. you can deliver. Yeah, that's what we're worried about. When we like, there's a ship over there of X, Y size, uh, that we're worried about how many guns it can hit us with. So. If it's bigger than us, we're going to lose. So we generally want to worry about how many guns it has. Um, we'll put an asterisk on that because when we talk about the guns, we're not going to lose. But um, <laughs> anyway, so where I'm standing right now is the main hatch. And this is just one of the interesting things about ship design. So this ship has to be a home and basically a small city wherever it goes. Um, we have all different kinds of divisions of labor on board. So everybody does different specialized jobs to make everything work together. So with, if any one of them falls apart, the whole ship doesn't really work. And you have to have certain things built in to prepare for any kind of situation that may arise. For example, over here we have pin rails, um, which let's see if I can pull one of these out here. This one's stuck. So one of the questions I often ask our visitors is, what is this? And kids see pirate movies and think of it as a club. 
but it's not a club. It's actually just a belaying pin. It's for belaying line anywhere on deck that we need it. And rather than having to have this really complicated wooden apparatus with all these pins in it all around the ship, we can have this pin rail and then we have the line belayed here, but let's say we have damage or a storm comes and breaks something and we need to rig up some kind of temporary replacement. I need it right just here. Well, then the good news is I can just put a pin in right here and now I have a place to belay a line. So, so it creates sort of a modular system exactly, throughout the ship. Exactly, yep. yeah. So it helps us just in case we need anything. Another example of that is these hatches, which allow us to get anything below deck that we need to. Mostly, in our case, talking about weapons and provisions to get down below, maybe some equipment. And on pass or passenger ships or on cargo ships, cargo would go down. Um, so we have the main hatch here, which is nice and big because some parts of the hatch are stacked over other hatches so we can go further down in the ship. And then other parts, like right here, it just goes right down to the gun deck. So if we're going to lower a, one of our ship's guns down, we're not going to lower it over the big hole that goes all the way down and then have to pull the gun over here. We'll just lower it right here. It goes straight down onto the deck and moves. Uh, interesting thing about hatches, this piece here, this little strip, that's called a batten. And that is used for if we're going to have heavy seas or a big storm's coming or something like that. They put a tarp over the hatch, just like the one over there. And then you use this batten to secure the tarp to it, so that way seawater, heavy seas, can't wash over the combing and get down in there. So when trouble's coming or when we're going to have heavy seas, you would hear the order to batten down the hatches, which is why we use that today for <laughs> like, oh man, here comes the boss or whatever. Batten down the hatches, that's where we get the term from. It comes from securing the hatches so that seawater can't flood the ship. So we're here on the quarter deck of Constellation. The spar deck is actually one long deck, so it's just the spar deck. But areas of the spar deck have ceremonial names from olden days when the upper decks of ships had multiple levels. So the quarter deck was kind of uh, an area that was raised where the captain would command from and his cabin was usually right off the quarter deck. This area of the spar deck is where he would be posted, so we call it the quarter deck. So if there was a promotion ceremony or some other kind of solemn event happening on board, it would happen right here. The gangway is also right here, so that when people come aboard, they would salute, or the com commanding officer came on board, this is where he would come. So this is kind of the command area of the ship. The advantage of being here is that we can see pretty much all the masts. We can make sure the wind is being caught. We can see the whole crew doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the aft end of the ship um, is where the, cap the commander's cabin is and the officer's wardrooms are, so they could just come right up a ladder and they're right here. So um, the helm being right here, generally a ship is commanded where it's steered because you're the one deciding where it goes. So since the helm is here, command space. We also have our capstan here. A lot of people ask us about this. This is actually the only machine we have on board the ship. Everything else is done by hand or by simple systems like blocks and takels. The capstan is essentially a giant vertical windlass. So just like you find on a modern sailboat, only this one's much bigger. And it's used to bring heavy things on board the ship. It provides the power for our pulley systems to be able to lift anything heavy that we need to bring on board, such as one of the guns, provisions, supplies, or even the anchors. Anchors weigh 4,400 pounds a piece. We have 13 of them. And so they would be brought on board using the capstan. And then just aft of me is our helm. Uh, this one's a double helm. Anyone want to guess why it's a double helm? You have multiple men on it? Yeah, it's, well, so there's two of them. That's first of all. And yes, the advantage of this, there's two advantages. One is that uh, the ship weighs 2.8 million pounds, so when seas are pushing it or we're getting heavy winds, it's going to be hard for one skinny little sailor to just use this simple apparatus. It's just got some ropes tied to a tiller, so it's not particularly complex to keep this thing on, on course. So you could get six, eight guys on here all hanging on or helping to steer it and keep it on course. Uh, the other advantage is that this simple rope system here is attached down to the tiller, which is the stick that pulls the rudder left and right. So on like a small dinghy today, you'd have a tiller with your attached to your motor. So your tiller is the stick. We have a big one um, down below. And this, that's what pulls this. So rather than having to have some complicated gearing mechanism that turns vertical motion into horizontal rotation, we just have this axle here uh, between the two helms and it makes it real easy for us. Um, the helm is a little bit vulnerable on this vessel because it's exposed completely to enemy fire. So not only is the person standing here in danger so our helmsman could get shot or wounded or killed, uh, the whole helm could be blown away. Usually helms are tucked underneath of an overhang or some other protected place. But the needs of the ship and the design just make it so we have to put it here. One common question I like to ask people on board is, uh, notice where the helm is. Why do we think the helm is at the back of the ship? It's at the aft end. 
The reason for that is because this is where the rudder is. And rather than having to have this cable go through the entire ship, they just put it back here to make it easy. Plus, it's a sailing ship, so I need to be able to stand like this and keep my eyes up in the sails to make sure that uh, the wind is being caught properly and that we're not having a slight change in the winds. So I can do that from here. The problem is the bow is all the way up there. So to see where I'm going, it's going to be hard to see from back here. We do have lookouts, but they're looking out for enemy ships and things like that. All we need to worry about is keeping on course. We know that, for example, Baltimore's in the mid-Atlantic and England is the northeast. So if I'm going to England, I use my binnacle here and set a course for the northeast and I just make sure I'm following the northeast heading and we're going the right way. So I really don't need to see where I'm going. Um, the biggest obstacle I have on a sailing ship is that the wind might not be blowing northeast and then we have to figure out some alternate course. But we do it by compass and especially when you're out on the ocean, the ocean looks the same in every direction. It's just grayish blue against a bluish gray sky. So there's nothing for us to maneuver around anyway. It's going to be using the compass. Now you mentioned at the beginning there about how this ship kind of represents the culmination of really thousands of years of kind of sail pow powered ship technology. So what are maybe some examples of things that are different on this ship than some of the, the centuries prior to this? What are maybe some of those technological things that this ship would have had? Sure, so um, there's not actually too much different. Um, by this period, sailing vessels had kind of reached their pinnacle. Um, the challenges aren't so much making them uh, more agile and seaworthy. It's more about how many guns and how powerful can you make a ship with a small enough size. Just like today, you want to have efficiency. So yeah. you want to have as inexpensive uh, a device as possible to carry as much firepower as possible. So the real advances in here are being able to control the ship, being able to catch wind from as many points as possible so that we don't have to alter course too much. And so being able to be small enough and to have a profile such that we can be as maneuverable as possible while also carrying guns that make it worth putting a ship like this together and putting it at sea. So it's kind of a combination of several factors. The hull design, the hull shape, um, the amount of sail against the size of ship that we can put up matters. So having three giant square rig sails is good. Square rigging isn't the most efficient um, for catching wind from different points. You can catch more with a fore and aft rig sail, which is why we have this big spanker sail here. Fore and aft allows us to catch wind from more angles, but it's not as powerful of a push. You want the um, wind to be hitting as close to 90 degrees as possible. And so with this, 90 degrees is going to be coming sideways. So we're not going to want to, want to go sideways. The best angle is roughly from a, a reach or a slight following wind from behind. So one of the angles to the side, slightly to the side of the ship, because then we're filling each mast as opposed to just filling the back one and then the rest of them are all loose. So it's a number of things. And then the type of guns we have also makes us really powerful. And then having different rigs and different designs put up, having different designs of machines and moving parts, things that weren't really available until industrialization that you couldn't really make, so they're super durable, all goes, in, all goes into the design. So this device here is actually called a chip log. Now this one is currently being repaired, so we're missing the chip, which is actually a big wooden wafer. It looks like a, looks like a slice of cheese almost. Um, a thin slice of cheese that would have the end of this line tied to it. And what we do with it is, we toss it overboard and it reels out like a fishing reel and that chip catches the sea as the chip goes and it gets pulled out and what we do is in a given amount of time while we're running a timer we count how many of these knots that are tied into the line at interval go through our hand so we count how fast the knots are going out through our hand in a given amount of time which tells us our speed which is why speed on a ship is measured in knots because you're counting actual physical knots it's about 1.1 miles an hour not great for tall people down here? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you actually get used to it. <laughs> it's, uh, I kind of just, like, actually, I'm not really thinking about it right now. I just kind of know how high to keep my head, and you get used to it. So we're now standing on the gun deck of USS Constellation. Three guesses why it's called that. There's uh, 20 guns down here when the ship was in service. So we have eight of these big boys here, the eight-inch chambered shell guns. They're a relatively new weapon in the Civil War period. They came online first in France in the 1850s and then spread all over the world. And then at the end of each line, there would be a long gun, a 32-pound long gun. One of them's over there. A replica of one is there. And uh, so there'd be one of those on each line. So we have eight 
of these big ones and then one on each end of a long gun, so four of those. So um, 16 plus four is 20, so 20 guns down here, and then we have two rifles up on the spar deck. So 22 gun sloop of war is the full classification for Constellation. And these guns um, are why they took a frigate, the frigate Constellation, which has about 50% eh, more guns than we have, and built this one. So this one is the more advanced one that has better firepower than the frigate, and it's because of these. These shell guns were an innovation <clears throat> because they fire exploding shell, hence the term shell gun. The long guns, like the 32-pounder there, they fire what they call shot, which is a solid iron ball weighing, in that case, 32 pounds. And all a shot is going to do, this is a real common misconception that people get all the time, is it comes through an enemy hull like ours, punches a small hole, this is a, this is a pin here, but imagine a hole slightly bigger than this, punches a hole through the hull here, comes inside here and winds up maybe bouncing off the other ceiling there, rolling around on deck, and that's it. The only harm that's done is this hole that's been punched here and anybody that happened to be unfortunate enough to be standing right here when it comes in. Everybody else is fine. It's just this hole. And so you hear a lot, like on Mythbusters, they did a whole thing on the splinters breaking off and hurting people, and it's because you hear about that because when you look at casualty reports, it says the biggest cause of casualties was splintering and shells coming in. Which, yeah, when a casualty is anybody who is wounded, missing, captured, or dead, all of those are casualties. The biggest source of injuries and boo-boos comes from little splinters breaking off, but if you've got a splinter in your hand, it doesn't exactly kill you. Um, they're a little bit bigger here, and they do go faster, but they're not really a source of death. They're a source of people going to get Band-Aids and bandages put on. So what will happen is, after the action is over, and we've either lost so many people or run out of ammunition and we've surrendered, the ship will be captured, and then it'll be repaired with very little effort, and then taken into service or sold, and everybody gets some of the money. So the ships don't really sink in prior years. They do sometimes if you, like the magazine catches fire, but like the Battle of Trafalgar um, in 1805, uh, like what, 80 ships were going at it uh, for like six hours, none of them sank, because they punch in holes above the waterline that are very small. This one, all that stuff I just said, you throw it out the window. <laughs> because this one fires an exploding ball. So an exploding shell does not punch through the ship here and wind up rolling around on deck harmlessly over there. It winds up punching through the hull or getting stuck in the hull, which is worse. And then it has a little fuse on it, and it's filled with gunpowder. So when that fuse burns down, it does not leave a tiny hole. It tears out whole sections of ship, gun port to gun port. This whole area would be gone, blown inward. Everybody in this whole vicinity is now being hit with shrapnel, fire, exploding shockwave pressure, causing internal bleeding, and now the ship's got a gaping hole in it. So <clears throat> that's when I said earlier, we, uh, we're going to win pretty much any battle we're in. I'll put it this way. These came into service in the 1850s. By 1862, we had our first Battle of Ironclads. So we had sh wooden ships for a 1,000 years with cannons on them, and then <clears throat> these guns come into service, and in less than 10 years, we have iron ships because wooden ships are useless against this. So we didn't really have a lot of combat, because if we go up, a ship, go up against a ship like us, it's going to be a mutual destruction. We're just going to be, it's going to last for minutes, and we'll be done. So we didn't really have too much combat. We fired our guns a few times, but <clears throat> no real combat, which is why it's still here. So yeah, this gun could pretty much overpower anybody. It took 14 men to operate it. The shot and shell, this one uses shell, Shell weighs 52 pounds, which was carried from below through passing holes and then brought to the gun by ship's boys, who are anyone from, uh, are sailors from age 11 to 17. So teenagers, teenage boys carrying 52-pound balls once every three minutes or so up to their gun and nine pounds of gunpowder. So when this deck was in action, the entire space would be thick and foggy with smoke, so you really couldn't see anything, and it would be horrendously loud, <clears throat> so combat was deafening, literally, um, when they were working these guns. And then if you just take a look at me and you wonder why we're using children to run powder and things to the guns, it's because somebody like me has a tough time when it's thick and foggy with smoke trying to get through a space, and this isn't even crowded. There'd be 14 men on each gun, so this entire thing would be filled with 140 people standing right here. So somebody my size, not gonna do so well, but a younger kid can kind of scamper through and get to where he needs to go. 
So these guns I mentioned are the eight inch shell guns. Um, what that refers to, I can actually go behind you here. Yeah, they're called eight inch chambered shell guns and that's because the back of the gun has this little area here called a chamber, which is where the gunpowder sits. And then the ball, this is actually the, the trunnion piece here on the diagram, but let's pretend that's the shell that goes to the back and then it kind of sits in this wider area and completely plugs this. That's an advantage because without that, if the bore was just the same diameter, then when the gunpowder is ignited, gases will leak around the shell and won't provide any propulsion. So it'll still get some, but it won't get all of it. Having the chamber there allows us to get all the propulsion expansion from those gases pushing the shell out. So we get a little bit more velocity, a little more distance out of the chambered shell guns. So 14 men operate these things. They weigh about 10,000 pounds. And sorry about that. I'll start again with that. So they take 14 men to operate and weigh about 10,000 pounds. Most of the men operating it are actually just moving it in and out. You only need about four to actually load it. Everybody else is just to heave it in and out. So you have about half the crew on each side takeo, which is used to run it out. And then when we pull it in the first time, there's a train takeo back here. It's called the train takeo, and you just pull it in a little bit. A couple of guys from each side just pull it in. Once we start shooting, we don't have to pull it in because it rolls in on its own through recoil which is what this big line here is. This is the breaching and it secures the gun up to the hull. So that way when it rolls back, it can't roll back the 20, 25 feet it wants to go. It can only go about this far and then it stops. So that's what the breaching lines are for. Each of the guns have one. And then the first thing that would happen is they have to actually clean it. Not necessarily clean it, but to render it safe. I'll, I'll say it that way. That's the most correct way to say it. So we use these implements up here. <clears throat> we have a uh, wet sponge and so we would serve the vent and sponge it out so the vent is the hole here at the back where the primers provide the flame to the powder charge the cartridge so we clean out the vent and our gun captain back here covers the vent with his thumb to prevent air from going in and out of the gun while our forward crew there numbers one and two use the sponge dampen it and then run a wet sponge down inside the bore um, that's not so much to clean it as it is to put out any leftover burning embers or ashes. Um, if the next step is to put gunpowder in there. So if there's a burning ash or coal still a lit in here, it's going to be a bad day for whoever puts it in the front. So we extinguish all that to make it safe. Keeping the vent covered here creates a vacuum behind the sponge. So when the sponge is pulled out, you hear a nice boom noise and that, that makes sure with the wet and the lack of oxygen, there's nothing alive in here anymore. So once that's done, then our powder monkey, who again was an 11 to 17 year old kid, runs from the passing hole, which in this case is back there underneath that ladder. Somebody passes him the powder, so he runs the cartridge up to the line of men here on this train takeo, who then each pass it forward very carefully, not just so they don't spill it, but also make sure they don't get shot so everybody passes it like this and protects it like a football, because if you get shot, then you just die, not everybody else. But if that gets shot, that's bad. So everybody passes it up, they throw it in the front of the gun, ram it down, then we have to actually put the projectile in. So again, powder monkey runs to the passing hole, grabs a shell. This time it's a 52 pound iron ball, runs it up. Same thing. They pass that up through there, get it loaded. And now that it's loaded, it's dangerous. So we need to push it back out into the position it is now run out. So that's where all those men on the sides use these side takeos and run it back out until it gets all the way out. And that has to be done in sync because if one side pulls and one side doesn't, the gun just swivels. So everybody has to work together as a team. So they would practice this drill, gun drill, daily to make sure that when people start shooting at you and death is all around you, you can focus on what you need to do because it just becomes second nature. You can do it in your sleep. So they do that. They get everything run out. And then once it's run out, we can prime it and get it ready for ignition. So we poke a hole in that powder cartridge with our vent pick. So you run a pick down here poke a hole in the powder bag down inside the bore. Then you place our friction, or not a friction primer, a primer just in general. It looks like a roofing nail. It's a goose quill filled with gunpowder and a little cap on top, just like a modern cap gun. Put that on there. And then we get ready by aiming it and adjusting the elevation. So the last thing we do is aim and elevate because this whole time I've been talking, we've been loading the thing, the ships are moving. So if I aim it first, it's gone from wherever it was. So we aim get ready and then the lanyard is pulled to actually fire it. Hammer goes down, hits that cap, 
cap explodes, sends fire through the goose quill, through the hole in the powder bag I just poked, the gunpowder bag explodes, shell leaves at supersonic speed, if everything's gone right. So that was like 14 steps to fire one round of these. We'd have to do that once every three minutes. That was considered a proficient gun crew. And it's important to note, all this stuff I'm talking about here, at some time during the Civil War, they noticed and said, hey, instead of putting the gunpowder in, the shell on top of it, putting a primer in, why don't we just make a thing that has a shell, a powder cartridge, and a primer already on it? It's your modern bullet. So during the Civil War, the first breech-loading weapons went into service where they just took all that stuff, put it together into one cartridge, and then just started sticking it in the back and using a pin, firing pin, to push the primer and then getting it to explode. And now we still use those today. So that, they started in the Civil War. So just interesting connection there. What, what was the strategy in terms of, I know you mentioned how the ships would be moving this whole time, yeah. so was the goal to have kind of all the guns fire at the same time, or was it, uh, you know, one at a time as, as the, the target came into range? What was the typical strategy there in naval sure. combat? Sure, so the, uh, the, main, the short version is, if I had to give this in one sentence, the short version is we want to fire as many shots as quickly as possible. All the aiming, elevating, sighting, all that, artillery is a very mathematical process. When you're talking about ships and moving targets, mathematics mean nothing. What really matters is being able to launch more projectiles at them than they can launch at us as quickly as possible. And so generally, gunnery, naval gunnery, is all about speed and efficiency. Um, the things you do have to consider, even on a ship, is not so much angle of arc and things like that, but more of um, just where we are in position. So <clears throat> first, first off, we mentioned um, like a broadside, where we fire all the guns at once. That's an effective land-based tactic, especially with infantry. Everybody all fires their guns at one time because you can hit really hard and crush the enemy's morale. All of a sudden, half of them are dead, and then you just advance with bayonet, and they're, they're running. Um, nobody's going to be running away when they're protected by giant wooden walls. The only thing that's really going to happen is our ship's going to have a lot of stress put on it. All these guns are going to recoil back at once. And now, when you're talking about speed, trying to fire, well, now we're all unloaded. So now we all have to reload again, which means there's going to be three minutes where we're not returning fire for what gain? Well, most of our shots bounced off or missed. So there's really no point in doing a broadside. What typically they try to do is just do independent firing, so everybody just fires at will as fast as they can. Sometimes they'll do a thing where they'll go down the line and everybody fires at once, but it's, all that stuff requires coordination, which takes time, and it, it could be time that you're spent shooting. So they don't really worry so much about that. What we do have to consider is our position, and position is extremely important on a ship. For example, if we are against another broadside battery like this, they're parallel to us, then we have a nice bit of protection here. Every gun that they have is going to be returning fire in a small window like this. So every one gun that they have, the one directly across from us, is only a danger to us. It's not a danger to them over there or anything like that. So we'll, we'll be in danger from basically one gun, or one or two guns maybe right here if there's multiple decks two or three maybe, right here. If an enemy ship maneuvers around and comes up across our bow, what that means for us now is that to face them, we only have two gun ports that are facing forward, which means we can bring two guns to bear on them, but they can bring their entire battery to bear against us. So we only have two guns that can shoot them, they use all their guns to shoot at us, and when their shells penetrate, instead of coming through here and knocking you out, they penetrate up forward and everyone in line all the way to the back of the ship gets hit. It's called raking fire and the battle ends very quickly when you get raked because everybody gets taken out. So we want to make sure the enemy does not get forward of us or aft of us with her guns to bear. That's why the action of Trafalgar, why Nelson was so famous because that's exactly what he did. He went right at the French line crossing the T and every French gun came at victory and she made it somehow with a huge proportion of casualties. But um, So it's it's a risky move. I wouldn't have done it, but it's, that's, I'm not Nelson. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's a bad news to be in. And then the other thing you have to consider is that when the wind is blowing, the ships heel over. And so if we are upwind from the enemy, then our ship, if the enemy is that way and the wind is blowing that direction, then our ship's going to want to heel over this way. So all of our guns are going to be pointing down. His answering guns are going to be pointing up. So he'll have a lot more range than I'm going to have. And if we have multiple decks, some of the gun decks may actually go below the water, so they can't even bring the guns to bear. So you, your position 
they call it the weather gauge in like movies like Master and Commander. It's being the, having the advantage of the wind so that you can maneuver the most. You want to consider that. But that's not our job down here. That's the commanding officer's job at the officer of the watch. That's his job to make sure we get in the right place. Um, all we're going to be worried about is doing this as fast as possible so we can get as many shots off as possible. And actually, believe it or not, it makes battle less stressful. If you don't have to worry about anything except for what you're doing, it puts less stress on you because you just do what you got to do and you don't worry about what everybody else is doing. That's generally kind of how it works in our case. When this ship was built, um, I like to joke that she was obsolete the day she went into the water because the only reason she got built at all was because they had actually allotted money for a repair to the frigate constellation, which was this original one from 1797. And our shipbuilder, John Linthal, down at Gosport Navy Yard in Norfolk, Virginia, um, took a look at the old ship and realized that that would be a colossal waste of money because the ship was so far gone and so obsolete with its large size and uh, less stable than a modern ship would be. It wasn't really worth taking that money and fixing that old ship. It was so far gone. So they took that repair money and used it to essentially create a smaller ship, which is the main reason why this is an all-sail ship. It's going to look suspicious to the Congressional Committee that a lot of the money, if you, they gave you money to repair an all-sail ship and all of a sudden it has an engine in it. <laughs> so <clears throat> they kind of just took that and built a smaller ship that kept the name. And <clears throat> that's why this got built. But at that time, the Navy was already converting to steam, so they wouldn't really have consciously wasted money on a sail ship at that time. So that was kind of a fluke that this one got built. But now we have this nice relic, so I don't complain too much. Um, her first assignment was to the Mediterranean in the um, middle 1850s. She was assigned to go there and essentially just do diplomatic missions. Show the flag was kind of what they say. Show, go, just go around and show the flag. Um, sounds kind of useless when you're talking about taxpayer money funding such a thing. Just go sail around and show the flag around. But there is a geopolitical concept um, called prestige. And sometimes they also use force projection as the modern term they like to use to, for the same kind of thing, where if uh, we're an up-and-coming backwater nation away from all the goings on in Europe at the time, and all of a sudden you look out in the Bay of Naples and you see a ship this size with these guns flying an American flag, all of a sudden you think, oh, well, maybe those guys are worth talking to, or maybe we shouldn't mess with those guys. So it just it helps to put our presence onto the world stage. So there's not a um, immediate return on investment that you can point to, but when it comes to trying to negotiate trade deals or negotiate other diplomatic and foreign relations, you come from a much stronger point if you can look out in the harbor and say, well, I have this. So, so that's, that was kind of what we were doing there. And then the <clears throat> most exciting part of the ship's history, we believe here at Historic Ships, came from the 1859 to 1861 tour on the Africa Squadron. The United States was under treaty obligation with Britain during the, um, early, the first half of the 19th century to do something about the illegal slave trade occurring from the west coast of Africa. So the trade in slaves, the Atlantic slave trade, had been outlawed in this country in 1808, and the entire practice was outlawed in Britain around the same time. And so in both cases, in both, both nations, it was illegal to bring people from Africa to be enslaved and uh, work in this country or that country. Um, the problem is that the practice wasn't outlawed in our country. So the, there was still a use for them, for slaves in this country. And so just like today with drugs or any other illicit thing that's illegal, um, when you can smuggle it in at a thousand percent profit margin, mm -hmm. people are going to do it anyway. And so there was a real problem with illegal smuggling of slaves coming from the coast of Africa over here. And so Britain, being the naval power of the world, took it upon itself to just stop everybody over there and go after ships they thought were carrying slaves. Problem with that is that there's one country that Britain just fought a war with over boarding their ships, and it was us. So the War of 1812 was precisely fought because they were boarding our ships and taking our sailors and pressing them into service. So the US government doesn't like that too much. And Britain, essentially, the short version is they say, fine, then you put your own ships out there to capture yours. We'll capture everybody else's. And so the agreement was made. We would put a force of 80 guns off the west coast of Africa to capture American flag ships. And Britain would take care of all the rest. So there was an African squadron by the US Navy, four ships on station off the coast of the Congo River. 
in West Africa. And it had to be 80 guns. It could be one ship with 80 guns, could be 10 ships with 8 guns, just had to be 80. In our case, it was about four ships. Constellation took over the flagship of the squadron, command of the squadron, in 1859 and served there for three years. During her stay on the African squadron, the squadron itself liberated 4,000 captive Africans destined for slavery in the New World. The ship itself, the one we're standing on, liberated 705 from the Bark Cora in 1860 and then captured two other ships that were found to be slave ships, but they didn't have any slaves on. They were just outfitted as slavers. So it was like finding an empty drug trafficking van. Like we just, we know what it's being used for, but you couldn't charge them with actually trans, transiting slaves. So um, that's, that's kind of the most exciting part that, that we took. It was our real, the only real significant military and combat duty the ship took part in. But in 1861, the ship is recalled to the um, United States because we had a eruption of violence here, the Civil War, and we have bigger things to worry about than a few hundred Africans coming off the coast every day. So they um, send the ship back and she is sent back to the Mediterranean. <clears throat> so Mediterranean squadron during the Civil War was there to protect Union shipping. Basically the same job as she was doing before in the Mediterranean. And um, we know now in hindsight that there really was never any danger in the Mediterranean from Confederate naval powers. The, I'll put it this way, the Confederates had one or two famous raiding ships and everyone knows the names because those are the only two ships that did anything. Um, <laughs> the Confederate Navy was almost non-existent. So sometimes people say, well, the Alabama did so much. I'm like, no, the Alabama did the only stuff. So that's mm -hmm. why you know its name. <laughs> they didn't do all that They much. had larger problems yeah, than yeah. going into the Mediterranean. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so Constellation was there, sailing around in the Mediterranean, performing diplomacy. There was a real danger, at least it was thought, that because of the supply of cotton for the economies of France and England particularly, that they may intervene in the war on behalf of the Confederacy. So just like I said before with force projection, if you're meeting with a Confederate agent talking about how you could help, and you look out in your harbor and there's an American warship sitting there, you may think twice about helping the rebels. So that's kind of what our role was. Just as So our, our captain, our commanding officers were more diplomats than they were military commanders um, for the Civil War period. And then in 1865, the ship is brought home because the enlistments are going to expire. In those days, you enlisted for three years. And so from 1862 to 1865, she's in the Mediterranean. End of 1864, she's sent home just so that she's here when the enlistments expire and they can just discharge the crew. What happens here when she comes from the West Gulf Coast up to Norfolk to discharge perfectly explains and encapsulates why this ship was obsolete. She encountered a Confederate blockade runner uh, off the coast, I think it was North Carolina, and that ship was a steaming ship. And so the ship turned into the wind and just steamed off. And being that we had no power, couldn't turn into the wind and follow it. So as the captain's report says, she followed, fired seven shots from the forward pivot gun, all of which missed but fell in good range. And that was the end of our combat service. So the only real Confederate ship we went after, we missed with the seven shots and couldn't chase them because we only have sails. So that was the end of our military career. It almost becomes comical when you kind of think yeah. about that picture. Yeah. Of that. Yeah. The advantage that we had really was in our endurance. Endurance is a concept even today in modern military um, and naval design. So we had a lot more endurance than a steamship could, mostly because we don't have to stop for fuel. So that's why this one went to the Mediterranean as opposed to serving in the blockade, because we can get there cheaply and stay there for a long period of time, whereas a steamship needs to refuel constantly. Which means you gotta find a port agent, you gotta find fuel, and make sure it's a friendly port, and all that. So she still had advantages, but by this time, in terms of her design function of being a warship, she was kind of already out of her league. And so after that, the ship is sent to first Annapolis, which is here in Maryland. It's the Naval Academy for training midshipmen. So these are officers in training. It's, it's essentially a college to make naval officers. And so she spends 20 years there as a training ship, doing summer cruises back and forth across the Atlantic, teaching the midshipmen how to sail ships. Warships in that period still did have sails because when you're trying to go long distance, it's more efficient to use sail. And so sail training was actually in part of the Navy training until 1926, believe it or not. So she spends 20 years doing that. And during that time, has a couple of neat missions. One was to bring artifacts to Europe and then from Europe for World's Fairs that happened several times. The last one being in the Chicago World's Fair, the Columbian Exhibition in 1893. Also in 1880, the US government took on a 
um, challenge of supplying famine relief to the starving people in Ireland from the potato famine. And so in 1880, the ship's guns were unloaded, gun ports were sealed up, and the decks were loaded with as much food and provisions as they could get on here, and she was sailed to um, the modern day city of Cove in Ireland, which is, at that time was Queenstown in County Cork. And she um, unloaded and provided famine relief for the people in that community. And it just so happened the Duke of Edinburgh was there on his vacation or on retreat there and helped to oversee the unloading and had a special commemoration for Constellation right on board here. So we have a great shot of the Duke of Edinburgh on board here with the captain. So just a couple of fun missions they were doing as part of their midshipman training. And then finally, she ended her career up in Newport, Rhode Island at the Naval Training Center there doing the same thing, just with enlisted men instead of the officers. So um, at the end of the 1930s or so, she was temporarily, well, in hindsight, temporarily decommissioned and put in ordinary with several other of the old historic warships like Constitution and others until World War II broke out. And in World War II, suddenly we're at war and all the fleets, ships have to go out to sea and go to work. And Admiral, then Admiral King, he was eventually promoted to command of the entire naval force. So his replacement, Admiral Ingersoll, didn't have a place to have their office. So they pulled Constellation out of ordinary, recommissioned her, put a radio room on board and some other modern things. Like we still have the, the showers, um, the remains of the showers on board from World War II are still here. And for six months or so, in uh, 1942, the Atlantic fleet was commanded from this vessel, <laughs> Admiral Ingersoll's office. So yeah, of all the ships in our fleet, the Navy's only ever repossessed one of them, and it was this one for use. So. Um, it's just kind of a neat way that, you know, almost 100 years after her initial building, she was still able to serve her country. So um, at the end of the war, she goes back into ordinary, and then in 1955, she's decommissioned and brought here to Baltimore, where she's been a museum ever since. So one interesting thing about this ship that doesn't exist on other museum ships is for a period of time, they actually weren't even sure what ship this was. Uh, we call it here in the museum, we call it the Constellation Controversy. And it comes from the fact that, remember that story I told you about the ship money being used? It was actually allotted to repair the old ship, yeah. and then they got used to build this one. So as a historian, when you look back in the records, now you have to question, well, so which ship is it? Because, you know, 100 years later, we're looking at the historical documents, and we see money for a repair of the old ship, and here's an old ship. So is this the old one, or is this some new one? Well, up until 1914, this ship was always referred to as the Sloop of War. Constellation. Everybody knew it was a brand new ship, a new class of vessel from the old one, and it worked in that capacity up until 1914 when then acting Secretary of the Navy, uh, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, ordered that this ship be repaired to her 1814 appearance. Now, earlier I told you this ship was built in 1855 or 1854, 1855, so it wasn't around in 1814. The frigate was. So since 1914 up until 1990s, everyone was referring to this as the Frigate Constellation, because for some reason, Roosevelt got it confused, and everybody else, he became president. Were you going to say the president's wrong? <laughs> so uh, everybody just kind of went with it. And so when we got the ship in 1955 here in Baltimore, they began restoring it to look like the Frigate. And so we wound up getting a ship that kind of looked like this down here at the bottom. And you'll notice there's a couple of things that are wrong about the Frigate design. First off, up here, there's a Frigate should have a square stern, open gun deck. The hull lines are fared slightly differently. The ship that we got in 1955 looked kind of like this, which is more of the sloop design. So from 1955 up until the mid-90s, they were restoring it to be like this, to try to make it look like the frigate, but it still had a round stern. It was just this, it was this mutant <laughs> ship that didn't really fit. It wasn't really a big deal. Everybody was calling it the frigate, and yeah, there was a couple of things that changed. Ships change over time, that's no big deal. Until the mid-90s when the ship was in such a state of disrepair that the Navy came on and said, you either need to fix it or we're going to take it and scrap it. So the city raised a bunch of money, about $9 million, and um, the ship was slated to be repaired. So now it's, well, let's repair it, let's rebuild it, let's get out the plans, and all of a sudden we're looking at the old plans and everything that's built here doesn't match the plans. And we're like, well, what ship is this? So we wound up getting really involved, and there was discovered that some of the curators here in the 50s and 60s had been forging documents, and the FBI forensics team had to get involved because people had put false documents into the National Archives with fake stamps to make this the frigate, because the ship was brought here to Baltimore because they thought it was the frigate. And would it be discovered that this was not the frigate built here in Baltimore, all of a sudden that was a whole wasted effort. So it was, they were trying to kind of 
make it seem like it was the frigate. And some of them actually believed that it was. There was one, one guy wrote that the ship's hull lines, that the entire hull structure had been changed in dry dock two or three times between 1797 and 1855. Namely in 1832, which is interesting because like the first dry dock in the U.S. didn't exist until the late 1830s, so there was no dry dock in which to do that. But um, you know, it's just, some of these people were just really sincere about believing it. Um, so anyway, there were a couple of main giveaways. One was that the drift pins, which are these pieces here, when they started pulling drift pins out, a lot of them had GNY stamped on them for Gosport Navy Yard, which is the Navy Yard in Virginia where she was built. So that was one giveaway. They wouldn't have that if it was built here in Baltimore. They also found a half hull model from 18, the 1850s down uh, in Annapolis somewhere. And a half hull model is only built when you're trying to fare out a new ship. If you're just going to repair an old ship, you don't b bother building a half hull model. So the existence of that model at all kind of proves that they built a new ship. So those are kind of the two damning pieces of evidence. So uh, it got really heated. There were lawsuits filed. Two people wrote books contesting each other and libeling each other, and it just got really involved to the point where other than this conversation, we kind of stay away from it because tensions still get heated here in Baltimore. When I first started working here, I went over to Fells Point, and um, that's an 1812, War of 1812 neighborhood. There were 1812 people over there. And I was like, oh yeah, I work on Constellation. And this one guy was like, they lied about that ship. And he's jamming his finger in my chest. I'm like, dude, I just started working there like a week ago. <laughs> like, but they, they, the emotions still get high about it. Like they, so, wow. So it's, it's, it's just an interesting topic. We kind of stay away from it other than to just tell you those factual um, anecdotes that I just told you. So anyways, we as the Modern Museum restore it and interpret it to her 1854 appearance, which is a Civil War period, which is what all the evidence shows us that it is, and that's historians, we have to go on the evidence, not what we want it to be. So um, anyway, that's the Constellation Contrary. So everything you see here reflects uh, an interpretive period of about 1862. This is the captain's cabin on board the ship. So everything from those bulkheads we just walked through to here is all reserved for one guy, hmm. the commanding officer. This is his personal space where he can kind of just get away from his responsibilities, which he'll do five or six minutes a day, that's a joke, uh, but not very long through the day is he not worrying about the ship. So not a whole lot of time is spent in here by the commanding officer, mostly just for eating his meals and then maybe in the evening hours when he's off watching um, delineates command down to the XO or somebody else. Um, so everything in here is reserved for him. Now there's a couple of different things in here. The main sitting area uh, would serve any function that we really need. It's currently set up in a way that the captain may have a few officers up here and dining with him, which he'll do a couple times a week, just like a boss in any company will have a staff meeting once a week or so, just to find out what's going on and uh, make sure that the ship's running smoothly and that there's no problems he needs to worry about. He has a nice sitting area where he can relax, catch up on business or correspondence from home, or just in the case of this ship, it's a diplomatic ship during the Civil War, so maybe a dignitary, a local mayor or somebody wants to come on and visit, they'll receive guests in here as well. The captain is served by a steward, who works in the pantry, which is right up here on that side. His meals are prepped there and drinks are served from there. So if the captain or any guests are on board, that's where he would um, have the food pre prepped for him and brought out. And then just after that is the office where the captain's secretary would um, work. Secretary was equivalent to a master, which is a, is, a, is a commissioned officer at this time. He's equivalent in rank, but doesn't actually do anything to command the ship. It's just a He's working next to the captain, so they have to give him some kind of rank that makes him better than the men. So, so they give him the rank of master, but all he is is essentially a secretary. And uh, Captain Stellwagen had his own son serving as his secretary, so it's not like he had to have any kind of formal anything. He, the captain could just pick somebody. So if nepotism was alive and well. <laughs> then um, back aft here is the port washroom, which is directly across from the starboard washroom. So the captain has two heads built into the cabin, whereas the rest of the crew all shares one. Wow. <laughs> so 319 men share one head, and the captain gets two. And the reason he gets two is because he uses one primarily, and the second one is re reserved for those guests that happen to come on board. Or, in the case of like the Africa Squadron, this was the command ship, which means we have not only the captain in charge of this ship, we also have the fleet commodore on board. So he has to sleep somewhere. He outranks the captain. So there's only one stateroom with a bed in it. So guess who gets to sleep in there? The admiral. And then he gets his own head, and then the captain would sling a hammock in the office, and then he has a head as well. So they both have to share the space. So that's why there's two. And one of the things that's interesting to me is um, if you take a look at this head here, it's actually through that door, and it's slightly 
aft, if you want to take a look, you can see the captain's seat of ease all the way in the back end. Um, all the architecture that goes into building this ship, the most ornate and decorative is right there. So why they picked the toilet to be the most decorative part, I really don't know, but that's the way it was designed. So um, it's just kind of one of those quirky things that after you work here for 16 years, you start to wonder, like I've answered all the basic questions, I know all those. It's like, why do they make the most ornate part the toilet? Um, <laughs> So anyways, and then his stateroom is just there where his bed is. Starboard side of the ship is always considered senior, even in the modern Navy. I really don't know why, it just is. So mm -hmm. the senior officers always sleep on the starboard side, so that's why his bed is there. And, uh, and that's why he moves over here if an admiral or a commodore comes in. Captain also has uh, freedom to decorate the space with his personal stuff. So these would be his personal bits of furniture his rug, he might have a few portraits of family or whatever hanging up on the walls, it's, it's his space. And being it, he could decorate it however he wanted. This often was the only space that would have carpeting on a ship like this. And this space, coincidentally, is also kind of like the principal's office in school, so you only really go there as a crew member when you're in trouble. They call it captain's mass, and so sometimes sailors used to call it getting called on the carpet because you'd come in here and this would be the only carpeted space. So that's where we get that term from. Also back aft, we have these gun ports, which don't look like gun ports because the captain doesn't have to look at gun ports all day. But that's how they function, and you notice they're the same size as the gun ports out there for the guns. So what would happen if we had a situation where somebody was coming across the stern, we could roll those guns right in here, pop those bulkheads out of the way, and just fire our guns right out the rear. So even the captain would sacrifice during combat. Is, is this furniture uh, representative of the era? Is this original from that era? Or? No, none of, none of this stuff is original. Okay. Um, we wouldn't, there actually is one original piece um, under the plexiglass back there. Um, that is an original piece of furniture, which is why it's covered in plexiglass. Um, it rained this weekend, so everything in here is soaking wet. <laughs> um, so it would be really bad to put old artifacts in here. So everything, as I said earlier, is set up to look as it would in 1862. So that's representative furniture of what you might find. Um, same thing with what you see on the table here. The, we have, believe it or not, they don't really keep the, that detail of records of what kind of things would be in here. We do have a thing called a table of allowances, which is stuff that the Navy would, agreed that it would pay for if the captain wanted it. So we do have records that one of them is a secretary desk, which is in the office. Um, we do have evidence that that would exist here. Um, a big desk for him to do his business. So when you come in and you you're face the captain for punishment, you're not gonna be sitting down at a nice table. You're gonna be <laughs> standing at attention in front of his desk. Um, so that would be out here. That was on the table of allowances. We also just like to have our board meetings and meetings with clients in here. So we, we keep it nice for that. Um, the other piece of evidence that I have was we had an engraving, I found in a newspaper article from the 1890s where a sailor had been and involved in a, what I call a courts martial for um, consensual buggery. And um, the, it means homosexual encounter, which was not allowed in the, uh, in the Navy. And that wasn't the issue. The issue was that he had been compelled to force to buy, compelled to testify against his will. And so there was an investigation going on in that because even in the Navy and the military, you, can't, you have certain rights and they couldn't force him to do it. And the newspaper article was talking about that. Okay. It was talking about they forced this poor sailor to testify and it happened on Constellation's captain's cabin, and they had an engraving of what the cabin looked like. So we have a good view in the 1890s of this way, looking this direction, which is how we have evidence for the curtains to be up here on the windows, and the uh, cabinet here for China. And then actually there were two chairs sitting right in this area, two Morris lounge chairs and a table, which we have to keep the clear for visitors so we don't put them in here. And plus you have this. I don't know why you would put a chair here when you have this, but. That's what the engraving showed. So we use evidence like that, primary source, and in that case, sec secondary source, because it's somebody's account of what they saw. And that's the evidence we use for mundane details, like what kind of furniture would be in here. So we have to kind of guess, and we just take our best guess as to something that would be typical of the period. When the ship went into combat, would this space be transformed very noticeably? Would they be moving things around just to kind of prepare for possible battle, or how, how would that affect uh, this type of a space on yeah, the ship? Yeah, so some of the fancy stuff would be put away. Um, if there was like silver sitting out or something like that, that would all be taken and secured down below in the orlops. And then if we needed to, they could start popping bulkheads out of the way and rolling guns in here, but you don't do stuff unless you have to. And right. So they would just kind of take precautions with the valuables and uh, the captain would be gone. He would be up on deck, getting ready to direct the ship. So it would mostly be empty 
and then when he was ready, they would put everything back. Were the two sides of the ship pretty much identical in this setup and yes. the way they were used? Yes, they, um, both sides are identical, and we only have enough crew to man one side at a time. So the gun crew that works this gun would also work this one if needed, because <clears throat> ideally we'd fire this way, and then if we maneuver in such a way that we need to fire this one, we're not going to need to fire that one anymore. So you only just go back and forth. If we get into a situation where we need to fire both sides, the gun crews could split up, but that means we're surrounded and we're probably going to lose at that point. So we would just probably surrender. All right, so we're now in the galley on USS Constellation. This is where the entire crew's food and meals are prepped and cooked. Now, they're not consumed up here. In fact, this deck, the gun deck, would be just empty during the day. Nobody would be lounging up here, gazing um, lazily out at the sea and looking at the beautiful horizons. No, no. This deck has to be kept clear. Because if we suddenly, here comes an enemy, we got to be able to get up and moving. We can't be clearing personal stuff out of the way and whatnot. So this is clear. So the stove is cooking our food. The food is actually eaten down below on the berth deck, along with the sleeping quarters and everything else. So this deck is mostly clear. Now, it's not even really a galley up here. It's a stove on the gun deck. A galley is an actual room. We don't really have a room on board here. We just have the stove sitting out on the gun deck. So, But we call it the galley because everybody knows what a galley is. So. Galley was up here forward on the gun deck. The stove that you see here is representative of what the ship would have. We know what kind of stove the ship would have because in the early 20th century when the ship was first decommissioned and sat around for a while, it sat next to Constitution in um, dock and that ship still being in service, just like all ships do today when a ship is decommissioned, the vultures come and start stripping it and taking stuff off of it. And so Constitution took our stove, our taff rail, bunch of stuff off of here. So if you go to Boston, ladies and gentlemen, you see that ship, a lot of the stuff they have is ours. And the stove is one of the things that we believe came from this vessel. So um, about seven years ago, our curator went up to Boston, took a bunch of pictures, and we got some diagrams of their stove and had this one built as a replica for ours because we can't go tell the United States Department of Defense we're taking this back. <laughs> um, so this is representative of what our stove would look like. It's a replica of that one, which we have photographic evidence of from the 1920s of it being here. So it's a wood or coal burning stove. Either fuel works. And there's a roaster on the back and then a boiler on the front where we can cook pots of mostly stews and soups on board. And um, the Navy at the time of the Civil War actually had a very good supply system. And so for especially the ships on blockade duty just off the coast, they were getting resupplied constantly. So those eating of old moly hardtack bread and stuff didn't really happen too much in the Navy, except on ships like this that went across the world and had to be out at sea for five, six weeks at a time. Once your fresh food runs out, you got to dip into the, the traditional foods. We'll just, we'll just call them traditional foods. Uh, salt beef, dried vegetables, and hardtack which together you can basically make soups and stews. That's pretty much it mm -hmm. with those foods. So um, all that stuff will be here. And one thing that I do like to point out about the stove is that it's a wood-burning stove on a ship made out of the fuel that it burns. So what is the intelligence or the sense in putting a wood-burning stove like this and running fires inside of a ship that has a burn time of about a minute and a half? Why would they put the stove down here uh, as opposed to, say, up on the spar deck or somewhere else. What do you think? Mm, protection? Uh, so, correct. But protection from what is the follow-up question? Mm, the weather? <laughs> Very good. So, yes, it's protected from the weather. Here's how I like to phrase it. What's more dangerous? Having um, some sparks fly out that you have to quickly put out it's before they burn the ship down, or having a wave come over the side of the ship, put out the fire, and now you have 300 fighting angry sailors that night. <laughs> I'll take the first risk over the second <laughs> risk. So, yeah, you gotta remember the gun ports actually would be closed, so the water wouldn't be able to come through here in a normal operation, so it's well protected from the weather. It is forward on the gun deck because the wind on a sailing ship is going that direction, off the bow. It's not like a car where it's flying over us. So the smoke going off the stove goes up through the chimney stack here and then goes off the front of the ship. So it's not wafting over the crew while they're trying to work. So it is strategically placed yeah. down here for that reason. So the cook is the one up here preparing the food. So unlike the army where just a guy in your company that can make scrambled eggs winds up having to cook all your meals for you, here in the Navy we have a guy on board whose job it is to cook. Whether he was a cook in civilian service or not, doesn't really matter, but his job and his training is on cooking the food. So it's generally better prepared food, 
as a general rule. And he also, we also have a surgeon on board, and unless somebody's injured, the surgeon's job is to make sure everybody stays healthy. So you have a person on board, and the ratio here is a surgeon for 300 people as opposed to uh, the general surgeon for a regiment of 1,000. So we have a much smaller class size, if you will, that the surgeon has to look for, and he's making sure everybody's getting the proper nutrition. So sailors generally are much healthier than their counterparts in the Army. And it's largely due to our supply and our logistics systems. The steamships of the modern U.S. Navy in the Civil War with the steam um, boilers had fresh water too, sterile distilled fresh water. So uh, generally they ate a lot better. And then each, well the crew were divided up into messes where it was 12 to 15 people all in a group and they'd have somebody appointed the mess cook would come up and get the food from the stove and take it down below to the rest of them down below. So that's how we eat on board ship. So when the mess cook brings the food down to the rest of his mess, he'd find the rest of his messmates down here on the berth deck eating picnic style. In the American Navy, um, our men are too tough to need tables. <laughs> and uh, unlike the British Navy where they have to have proper manners and sit up at their tables. Um, so basically they would have a mess cloth, which is your rubberized canvas sheet there to keep the deck clean. The mess cook would come down, set everyone's plates and get all the stuff out, lay the food out and it's ready to go so when the men are piped to their meals at mealtime, they come down and basically just sit down and just like at home when your parents used to cook for you. It's all laid out for you, you just sit down and start eating because they only have a short amount of time to eat. So this way we maximize the efficiency. So the entire crew of about 150 at a time because we're, we're working in two shifts, so one shift's working while the other's down here eating. 150 men into groups of 15 or 12 all spread out through the birth deck here all eating in the same way and they eat like, like rates with like rates. So seamen with seamen, petty officers with petty officers, marines with marines, and the only group of people that doesn't eat together are the powder monkeys, the ship's boys, age 11 to 17, which parents, you'll know why very quickly, why you don't put a group of 11 to 17 year olds off in a corner by themselves with their food and unsupervised. <laughs> so they are spread out amongst the rest of the messes, but everybody else eats together to keep that hierarchy and that chain of command very prominent in people's minds. Officers also get fed from the galley, but they eat back in the wardroom in their private space, again, to make sure everyone knows they're special. So the rest of the space down here when we're not eating, this is the berth deck. And this is where the crew would be when they're sleeping or when they're not working. So the captain is the only member of the ship's crew who can roam the decks freely. Everybody else either has to be at their assigned station up top or their berth, which is down here. A berth just means where you belong. So USS Constellation is berthed at Pier 1 in Baltimore Harbor. The crew are berthed in here. And so during the day, these hammocks would actually not be here. The hammocks can, that's the advantage of using hammocks. We can take them down, fold them up. It's called tricing them up. And they're stowed up on the spar deck in the bulwarks around the edges in the hammock rails. So during the day when we're just relaxing down here, it would just be 150 men lounging around down here. So you can just picture it in your mind, what it would look like with this space filled with 150 people just doing whatever it is they do when they're off watch, playing games, talking, maybe grabbing a snack out of their sea bags, and uh, most likely napping because we work and sleep in four hour shifts, which means last night you only slept for four hours. So you'd probably see a lot of them napping down here during their off watch hours. Uh, the only light source you have comes through these portholes as you can see behind me and through the hatches. It's a ship made out of wood, so having a bunch of candles and whale oil lamps laying around on deck with clumsy sailors walking around is not a good idea. So that's the only source of light, so it's always going to be pretty dark down here. And um, you can feel the air temperature in here. It's kind of cool, so it stays kind of nice down in here temperature-wise, which is good for the Mediterranean. At night, the hammocks will be brought down, and the first watch would go to bed around 8 p.m. and then wake up at midnight, and they would work till 4 a.m and the opposite for the other crew. And so you get your hammock out, you use your pants for a pillow, <clears throat> maybe have a blanket, and then you would sleep just like this. And so <clears throat> people tend to find this rather comfortable and picture themselves being rocked to sleep by the <laughs> gentle rolling of the ocean. But it's actually not what happens. What happens is when we stop moving, I'm just laying here like this, gravity is keeping me straight and vertical and as the ship rolls around me I don't feel anything so during the night it doesn't feel like I'm moving my eyes are closed 
which makes for a much more comfortable sleep than somebody like one of the officers who has to strap themselves into a crib so they don't get tossed out of their bed in heavy seas at night. So you can argue it both ways. Some find the hammock more comfortable for that reason. Some people, like since I'm six foot five and I'm being bent in half right now, I might get tired of this after a while. And the hammock is also when you would, if you were to die at sea or be killed, you could be stitched up in your hammock and given a burial at sea right in your hammock. So this sailors have a personal connection to their hammocks. When you're new as a sailor on board, as a landsman, that means you're a brand new sailor. You come on board and you, when you enlist, you are expected to procure a uniform and you can bring one bag with you, a duffel bag. They call it a sea bag. It's a big canvas bag about three feet tall. And everything that you want to have with you for the next three years has to fit in that bag. That's the only thing you can bring with you. Yeah. So every sailor comes on board with his uniform and his bag. You go see the purser and you're issued out your hammock, which is just a sheet of canvas. It's up to you to get this hammock clue tied up and made so you can sleep tonight. If you don't know how to do it, find somebody to show you. And if they don't know you and they don't like the look of you, you may have to pay for it. So um, you have to, you're expected to find that on your own that night. And uh, we actually have a account of a powder monkey who went on board his ship for the first time and reported to the master at arms, who's like the cop on board ship, to have his uniform inspected, which was found to be lacking. So he had to go receive one out of the ship's stores, which cost you money out of your paycheck. And he wrote in his diary, in my first night in the Navy, I was two months in debt already. And that's an 11 year old kid. So you grow up real fast on board ships like this. Um, now I mentioned that this ship spent most of its time in the Mediterranean not really doing too much. Um, so that's one way to look at it is, yeah, the ship was, it was almost comical that it, it, it was obsolete and sailing around, not really doing very much. But if you think about being in a place like this, you know, the kind of person that might enlist in the Navy is probably somebody who didn't have a lot going on in their personal civilian life um, because they were able to just walk away and be gone for three years. Civil War changes that a little bit because there is a sense of patriotic duty mm -hmm. and wanting to serve the country. So we did have, for example, doctors walking away from their practices to join up and become surgeons and so forth. But especially those kids, those powder monkeys, an 11 year old kid might be in a home with six or seven brothers and sisters who um, are all struggling to find something to eat. Mom and dad can't get enough to feed them. And you're kind of just superfluous bodies at that point. And you live in a one room cabin where you're sharing a bed with all your brothers and sisters. Mom and dad might decide, you know, if we enlist them in the Navy, we get a monthly paycheck for it. And kid gets fed, clothed, he learns how to sail on a ship. And when he gets out, any merchant ship will take him on as a sailor. So he has job training and job security. It's a good deal. So you would join up on a ship like this, you'd get a, your own place to sleep, you'd learn how to do your own things, work on yourself. So by the time you're three years later, you're 14 years old, you're basically a man and can work on any ship that you want to in the world. And if you served on a ship like Constellation, this ship made port in places like Genoa, Spezia, um, Legorno, but then they, they called it Leghorn, but Legorno. They took trips to Rome, visited ports like Athens. Our yeoman, our ship's yeoman wrote in his diary, they took a trip and uh, a long sail and went over to Beirut in modern Lebanon and took a carriage ride for two days of liberty down to Jerusalem and saw the Temple Mount. Mm. And he went down there with the bosun. And so just imagine that. Have you ever seen the Temple Mount? I have, actually. You have. Well, yes. I haven't. And uh, you know, most people today... No, but, but certainly like at that most, time period. Yeah, I mean, most people today don't have that experience, <laughs> let alone 11-year-old kids in the middle of the 19th century. So imagine getting home from your enlistment and you talk to a big brother who was enlisted in the Army fighting Robert E. Lee down in Virginia. You know, I saw the ruins of Richmond and slept in a mud trench for you know six months. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, um, here's this thing I bought in Rome, and here's this piece of the Temple Mount I brought back from Jerusalem. Like, that's a hell of a life, yeah. even by today's standards. So you know, it really wasn't, you, know, you could sort of put it both ways. Like, the, you know, yeah, it's kind of a dull duty, but cruising around on the French Riviera versus walking around <laughs> in the swamps of Virginia, I'll take the Riviera. No, I think that's a really <laughs> interesting perspective, because yeah. to the modern mind, thinking about like 11 you know, teenagers at yeah. uh, that age of serving on a ship like this, kind of uh, sounds horrific at first, and especially in a combat situation, yeah. but then you think about it from that perspective. Yeah, I mean, even still today, the modern Navy, that's one of the big draws of the Navy, is like you see the world and yeah. visit all kinds of places. So uh, it was the same thing back then. So um, back aft, we have the orange room where the officers stay. When I have kids on board, I like to describe this like the teacher's lounge back here if you're in a school. So the regular enlisted sailors don't get to come back here. And these cabins just here, 
are today what we would call chief petty officers. Um, in this time period, they were warrant officers. They were guys who, just like today's chiefs, have a special skill that they've been trained in to handle on board the ship. So sailmaker, three guesses what he does. <laughs> Carpenter um, eventually became damage controlman, and now that actually that position in the modern Navy doesn't exist anymore. But gunner does still exist, gunner's mates, and we still have bosun's mates who are in charge of taking care of the weapons and taking care of the ship itself. So they still exist in the modern Navy, and as the chief enlisted people, they do get a little bit of privacy in these staterooms, but the real luxury is back here in the wardroom for the officers. <clears throat> so the officers command the ship, and again, starboard is the senior side. So all the senior, what we call line officers, are over there on the starboard side, and rank delineates forward to aft. So up there on the forward cabin is the first lieutenant, First officer, the executive officer, command, second in command of the ship, and then the second lieutenant, third, fourth, and fifth. Each one of those guys might take a turn commanding the ship when the captain's off duty, or be in charge of a gun division, or a, uh, a section of the crew that they're in charge of managing. Over on the port side are what they call staff officers, which serve staff functions. So like today in a corporation, you have your line officers in a corporation who your vice presidents, your managers, your foremans. Then you have your staff functions like HR, accounting, payroll. Here's payroll right there, the paymaster. He's in charge of the ship's money, making sure that when we go and have to buy things like supplies, he's the one that procures it and accounts for it. He also is in charge of payroll for the crew. You earn a monthly paycheck as a landsman of about $13 a month, which you're free to spend. You don't get paid until the end of the cruise, so you don't actually receive any cash until the end of your three-year cruise because I just mentioned we were sailing around the French Riviera. Somebody hands you a pocket full of money and you have a choice of hanging out in the French Riviera or this, <laughs> you're not gonna come back to this. So they don't pay you until the end to make sure that you come back. But you are free to spend money, so you come and take a loan out of the ship's treasury and at the end it's accounted for out of your pay. So paymaster does that. Surgeon is in charge of the health of the crew. So none of these guys actually command men. But they're just in charge of major shipboard departments, except for the Marine Lieutenant. He is in charge of the complement of Marines to serve as our security force on board the ship. So, um, yeah, so all 10 of these guys share this space as part of the luxury, privilege, and responsibility that they have as officers. And so they're kept separate from the men. It's a little bit different because in the Army, like a lieutenant who commands men would actually eat and live with his men to build the camaraderie. It's exactly the opposite in the Navy. In the Navy, it's like, no, no, I'm special. You stay over there in your area. And remember that I'm special because I get to come in here. And the reason for that is because you know, we're, we're, we're nowhere near any possible enforcement. An army has thousands of people around and MPs and all kinds of people to enforce the rules here. There's nobody. We're halfway across the world. The only thing that keeps everybody in line is everybody's acceptance of the way things are. And the way to get everyone to accept it is to constantly provide even subtle hints. Like if they get to stay back in the castle, so they're special. Helps to just, without any effort, maintain that aura of authority. We do have 44 Marines with bayonets, though, just in case they get out of hand. Um, yeah, so that's the wardroom area here. And then back aft, just through those doors there, is the tiller room. We can see the ship's tiller and the rudder, which comes from the helm, right through these lines here. Those lines I showed you earlier on the helm come right through the overhead here and just go right through the pipes back to the tiller. And that's how the, the whole ship is steered, correct? Yep. yep. How, how maneuverable was a ship of this size in terms of like turning operations and how? It's, how... it's, it's well, it, it, it's, a, it's, all, it's all a question of compared to what. Yeah. So compared to anything smaller, we're not as maneuverable. Compared to larger or bulkier things, we're more maneuverable. It has to do with your bulk and your size. Um, rudder size can make a difference too, but if your rudder's too big, then you have too much drag and it doesn't really work so well. So. I mean, yeah, she's moderately maneuverable, couldn't go up rivers or do things like that and make super tight turns. Um, you know, we'd have to do long arcs around the way. But it depends. You can do, you can do things like you can drop anchor and when you're underway, just drop anchor and pull your sails in and it'll swing you around real hard. They do it in Pirates of the Caribbean, actually. <laughs> um, so you can do things like that that put a lot of stress on the ship. But just generally speaking, it's kind of a nice, just a nice wide turn. The advantage of this system is that if something happens, I mentioned the helm is vulnerable. If a helm gets shot away, I can bring 10 guys down here and just grab the tiller and we can steer it just like a giant canoe, just by hand in there if we need to. So. And then if you notice in the wardroom, um, 
staterooms, they have those cribs I mentioned earlier about the hammocks. Um, these guys have to have a crib because that bed, you might roll out of it if the ship angles enough at night. Sometimes you can get a 50, 60 degree roll and you'll just roll right out of bed. So as opposed to the hammock where you just stay nice and snug all night. Another neat thing about the berth deck down here is on Constellation, I mentioned that about 40% of the ship is original. And I like to tell our visitors to the museum, when it starts to look old, it is old. And so if you look around here compared to what we've seen up on the upper decks, this looks old because it is. This is all original part of the ship. This dates from the Civil War period with a few updates and repairs here and there. But here and the deck below us, the Orlop decks are original to the ship. The wood that's used depends on which part of the ship you're talking about. The structural things and the outer hulls are live oak, which is like the hardest wood known to man. And uh, everything else is a lot of it's fur and um, like the decking was Douglas fur um, because spruce tr evergreen trees grow nice and straight and so you get these nice straight long lines of planking out of them uh, the oak being hard is good for structural supports like so big deck beams and um, outer hull planking where you need to have essentially armor around the edges you'd use oak for that but masts in particular are usually evergreen trees and uh, decking was i know was douglas fir but they had other like some of the what they call bright work so some of the fancier stuff like some of these railings would be teak or other exotic hardwoods that would hold up well and uh, that would be decorative parts of the ship. So it just depends on what part you're talking about. But generally you're looking at fir and oak are the two main ones. Mm -hmm. So here now we're in the sick bay on board ship. This is forward on the berthing deck and the location specifically is at the bow. If you look behind me right here, that is the bow of the ship, the inside. So this is where we're cutting through the waves. And this is where the men would come when they're seriously ill or seriously wounded. Um, surgeries actually weren't done in here. They would be done down in the Orlop decks where you're kind of away from the rest of the men who are just sleeping and hanging out out here. But when you're recovering or just being sick, this is where you'd come. Now, Civil War medicine is a long topic. I could spend hours talking to you about Civil War medicine. Um, but on the ship here, it's the same medicine that they're using everywhere else. Here in Maryland, we have the National Museum of Civil War Medicine up in Frederick. It's a great place to go and learn hmm. about um, Civil War Medicine. I plug them because one of their volunteers also volunteers for us, Dr. Brad. So um, I don't mind plugging them. The um, difference here on the ship is about the sick bay positioning. So it's put here on purpose, but it is the most uncomfortable room on the entire ship. Now, why? There's three reasons why. One is where we are. I mentioned we're at the bow, so this part of the ship is where it's bouncing up and down the most. Ships actually don't travel through the water like this. If you've ever been at a beach and watched a speedboat go by, you'll see that they actually do this. They bounce at the top, or at the bow, and then the stern stays relatively stable, which is why the officers and the captain are all back there. Um, modern day ships, that's also where the propellers are, which is why the captain doesn't stay back there. He stays up near the helm, but um, yeah, so we're doing this. So this part of the ship is where we are, the part that's bouncing a bit on the most. If you're seasick, you're not going to have a good time in here. The second thing is that above us is where the galley is. So the galley is directly above us, that stove cooking 400 degrees in an oven all day in the South Mediterranean. It's going to get real hot in here. So it's going to be swelteringly hot in here. Just forward of the galley, we have a manger where we keep some livestock like chicken, chickens, pigs, maybe a goat for milk. The deck is not watertight. Yeah, so everything that comes out of those animals winds up down in here, and it's swelteringly hot and bouncing up and down the mouth. So why would they put the sick bay here? It's a great question. Yeah, so the main reason for that is because A, germ theory is not really around. They have germ theory in Europe. They're just starting to figure it out. The Americans don't really get the picture until a little bit later. So we're not really worried about cleanliness. We're worried about people who aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. When you're here as a sick person, you're unable to contribute to the ship, but you still take up room, you still take a meal every day. And so it builds resentfulness pretty quickly. If all your crewmates are sitting out there like, he's just lounging in the sick bay all day and I'm doing all the work. And so just like today, <clears throat> I know you're not guilty of this, neither am I, of, you know, uh, <clears throat> uh, sorry, sir, I can't come in today. <clears throat> <clears throat> I'm sick, I'm, I'm not able to come in today. Well, that's a real convenient and easy way for a sailor to get out of work. So to prevent or at least to discourage that, the surgeon's gonna say, fine, you have to sit in the sick bay until you're better. Well, five minutes in here, you're gonna be like, you know what, I'm gonna go back to work. So the idea was to discourage blue flu, coming mm. in here and people trying to shirk their duties of getting sick. Plus, if you're in here, 
and you're miserable, all you're gonna be thinking about is getting better so you can get out of here. So hopefully you'll get better sooner. So that's why it's put here. Because these people aren't looked as looked on as people to be pitied. They're looked at people who aren't doing their jobs. So they're not given the best places. So anyway, that's the sick bay. Like I said, surgery is down below, but this is where you'd find people recovering. It'd be more crowded than this. We have two hammocks on display, but it'd be filled up with hammocks in here, as many as you could fit. Was there a recognition, obviously, with, uh, with several hundred men on board, you're going to have uh, different levels of you know, seasickness and the ways that they handle life at sea. So was there recognition that like some of the men just weren't going to handle it as well and, and would need more help in like a sick bay situation? Yeah, so um, landsmen in particular are, uh, are more susceptible to seasickness because you get used to that over time. Um, some people never get over it, but generally it gets better over time. So it's something that you just kind of deal with until you hmm. get better. Um, they also do have um, medical inspections when you come in to the service. They make sure you're fit for service. Um, they're not nearly as rigorous as they are today. And so you pretty much have to like be missing limbs to not be able to serve. Um, and so you did have various stages of health of people that just served on board here. And in particular, the Navy was desegregated. So there was um, black sailors serving on here, just along with white sailors. The black sailors, from the record we have, typically had more health problems, just due to civilian life and not getting as much nutrition, generally being poor. Um, so uh, the record shows that this, there was often a lot of the complement of black sailors were in here. And then the, we know that, that evidence I'm giving you is from our yeoman who served on board here in the 1860s. He was an older guy. And he had a lot of teeth problems, so he was in here all the time getting his teeth worked on, and he would talk about who his mates were in here, so that's how we know. Um, but it was just one of those things where, like, I guess I would have to assume, this is just assumptions on my part now, if, like, I had an elderly gentleman or a guy who was in his, who was, you know, middle age or later, and he had more health problems, I would just be like, well, you know, at least, God bless him, he's still working, mm -hmm. you know, like, today, and you'd kind of just accept it. But if it was, like, some young guy who's, like, always in here with a boo-boo or some other kind of problem, I'm going to get resentful of him. And so, uh, yeah, there, there were certain things they had to deal with, but generally speaking, everybody was okay um, working. And then they also did know a couple of things. For example, the, the real famous shipboard disease is scurvy. It's a vitamin C deficiency. So that was something they were acutely aware of. They weren't acutely aware of what caused it, but they were acutely aware that if you eat a lot of citrus fruit, you don't get scurvy. The connection really wasn't made other than cause and effect. Mm -hmm. And so um, citrus fruits were encouraged. The British actually first figured it out. And um, they started spreading, it spread around. So that's why they had, the surgeon was maintaining everyone's nutrition, make sure everybody had decent food to eat to keep their nutrition up. Because that was your biggest enemy on a board a ship like this was disease. And diseases thrive when the nutrition is not good and people's health is bad. So they exercise daily. The powder monkeys have to climb up into the rigging and back down every day to get exercise and stay healthy and around. So things like that would help to maintain it. And it wasn't until later in the 19th century sort of figuring out that it was these microscopic problems that you know, perhaps sharing clothes and sharing sink bowls and stuff probably wasn't a good idea. Um, but it generally was a pretty healthy environment, more so than in the Army, for sure. Um, that said, the biggest killer and the biggest casualty cause was still disease, but that was true of everywhere. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah, so... Uh, they noticed a couple of things, I'm sure one thing in particular. We've quickly run out of headroom down here, and uh, this is usually the part in the tour where people ask me, so were people shorter back then? And the answer is no. The, the average height of a Civil War sailor was 5'7". Today, an average man is 5'9". So it's basically the same as today. You had people as tall as me working on here, and they had short people too. So the reason the overhead is low is because of the ship's design and functionality. It needs to be very um, stable and buoyant in the water, and so the center of buoyancy is what keeps us upright. So um, football players know what is center of gravity. You want to keep as low to the ground as possible so that you don't tip over as easily. Same thing on a ship, only it's center of buoyancy. So we keep the center of buoyancy as low to the water as we can. So in places where we don't need a lot of people working like this, we sacrifice a lot of headroom. If you look back aft there, you'll see it's mostly just a storage deck. And we're still using it for its original purpose, which is just storage of supplies and things that you need to keep out of the bilges, which are down below, where the water collects. And so only people are coming down here a couple times a day to get supplies out. So we actually don't really need too much headroom here. You can just crawl around for a minute or two and get what you need and then get out of here. 
And so we sacrifice a lot of headroom down here. Same thing on the berth deck. Um, all it is is people hanging out and sleeping, so we don't need a lot of headroom there either. Gun deck, we do need some room because it's the guns, and then the spar deck has no overhead. So it just so happens that the order of precedent goes from bottom to top. So down here, we sacrifice a lot of headroom. And the Orlop deck that we're on isn't even really a true deck. We call it the Orlop deck. That comes from the term for overlap, overlap, Orlop. It's just a lazy corruption sailor talk of the word overlap. But it overlaps the hold. So the hold is the main area out there, but this deck just is more of a platform to keep things out of the water if we need them. So we'll head on to this catwalk here so that I can stand up. <clears throat> and we'll en enter into the ship's hold out here. And um, a couple of interesting things to point out. If, if I was giving you a short version, I could say, well, so this is where we keep all the cargo and provisions and supplies and like things like food and water. So just imagine it filled with barrels of food and crates and drums full of water. Okay, we're done. Like, that's pretty much it. Um, but what it does allow us to do is that with it empty like this, and being that this is all original part of the ship, you can actually see the original construction of the ship. So you can see all the parts and how the ship's actually put together, which I personally find pretty interesting. So um, you can pretty much step anywhere, even in here. This is, this is really strong, but okay. it's just you're likely to twist your ankle, so that's why I don't recommend it. But it's not like an attic where you're going <laughs> to fall through the ceiling. So down here in the hold is a really neat place on Constellation because you can see the, the construction and how the ship was built. And so what we're standing on here, this big timber, is the keel. So this is the main support beam for the entire ship. So this is kind of like the I-beam in your house, the thing that's holding the whole thing up. The foundation is right here. It is the original keel from the Civil War period. It's still in pretty good shape. The biggest problem we have with it today from a preservation standpoint is hogging. Um, H-O-G, so hog, and that's where the keel starts to bow up in the middle and dip on the ends. And the reason it does that is because the middle of the ship is fat and buoyant, and the ends are thin and less buoyant. So over time, gravity is pulling the ends down, and the water is keeping the middle up. So over time, it starts to bend like a hog. We have about a, I think it's a, it's a three or a seven inch hog in it right now. When we first got it in the late 90s, it had a like a three foot hog. It was, oh. it was real, real high. So they... Over a couple, over a four year restoration period, they put blocking under there and slowly pulled blocks out in the middle and had it slowly settle back to its shape. And then they reinforced the hull to keep the shape. So it's pretty stable. And that, that's a pretty good hog for that short amount of time. So, but it is something we have to keep an eye on because when it gets too much, then the ship's compromised. So you have to correct it every so often. And then from the keel, all the frames go out, which if you look up the sides, they kind of look like ribs. Sometimes kids see it as like a body or a skeleton, and that's pretty much how it functions. The frames hold up all the deck beams, which are in the overhead here. So the deck beams hook into the frames, and then the decks are just built straight up like that with four levels of framing, so, or four levels of um, beams. So the frames put all the weight back into the keel, which is why the keel is so important. And then everything is braced on the sides, the side of the ship on the inside is called the ceiling. So I have the overhead up top and then the ceiling on the side, not to make your life confusing, but that's, <laughs> that's what it's called. So the knees there um, are what help to keep everything from buckling too much as we move through the water and the stresses of the sea get put on. It helps to keep everything nice and stiff. And all of those beams and knees are all original timbers. And one thing I think is really interesting is if you take a good close-in look on those knees, um, you can see the wood grains in those knees actually follow that curve, that elbow shape. And that's because when the tree that that piece was made from grew, that piece was cut out of the tree in that wow. shape. And it gives it that much more strength. Instead of being two pieces like joined together mm -hmm. to make an L, um, they, it's always inherently going to be weak at the seam. So in this case, there's no seam. It's just the actual wood grain follows that curve around. So each piece, when the tree was cut down, that was cut out in that shape, at least roughly, out of that shape, and then hewn later into that precise looking thing. So each one of those is a super strong piece of wood. Um, and then there's uh, just an interesting thing I was talking about earlier. If you look, some of those knees have gaps in them. This ship was in, we had a dry docking of the ship. Um, two years ago, and they just did some cleaning of the sides and a couple of butt seam repairs where the seams of wood come like this. They just repaired some of the butt joints to keep the leaks down. And when we first came back, it was in dry dock for like four weeks. When it first came back, each one of those knees had like a six inch gap behind it. 
and we were looking at it like, hmm, something over here is moving. And it dawned on me much later, I was like, wait a minute, it's been in dry dock for four weeks. So it's been pancaking, like I described to you earlier. Mm. It was sitting on keel blocks, and it pancaked out. And sure enough, about eight months later, it's back to its normal shape because it's got the water pushing on the sides now, and it, it warped back into shape. So even now at 100 and, what is it, 160, 70 years old, it's still able to move and flex in and out. So we do keep an eye on it just to make sure things aren't moving too much. But it's still very much a live creature that has to be moved around. When a ship like this was built, was there a uh, time of service that was generally thought it would last uh, that before, before it was obsolete, or did they have like well, a certain number of years in mind? I don't really know. I don't really know what the plan is. It's, I was trying to go by what they do today. Today it's like five years is usually kind of what the, the mission design is for because the way technology progresses. It's um, very short. Yeah, it's very short. And then usually things outlive their, um, or they, they live longer than mm -hmm. the original design. Like we have Los Angeles class subs and things that are 30 years old that still work really well. Um, so I don't really know about a, a ship like this. I don't really know if they'd have a design in mind. They, it was generally longer than it is today. Um, one of the things I always found interesting is like down at Yorktown Battlefield, they have guns from the British in the Revolution that were from the 1600s. It's like using weapons, like imagine today using weapons like muskets, like they're that old. It's just like there was a lot longer uh, longevity than we have today. So, uh, but I don't really know the answer to that question, how long they'd be planning to use it. In, in this time period, I, I can't imagine it'd be very long because after the Civil War, they started building newer and modern ships. The ironclad race was on and then at the end of the century, they had the dreadnoughts come out. So there was always this like arms race up until World War One, really. But uh, yeah, I mean, she, this particular one, as soon as the war was over, they recognized that it wasn't really good anymore. So it was 10 years after it was built. So And yet, like you said, with the materials it was built with, it still is, is maintained yeah. today. So yeah, as I long mean... as there's somebody taking care of it, <laughs> there, it they, things will last. I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's the key is the maintenance. And these things are expensive to maintain, so it's just you take it, it requires uh, really requires a community that's willing to invest in it, which Baltimore luckily is. Um, we're proud of our waterfront and our, our maritime heritage here, so that we get a lot of support from the city and state and from the community coming out and helping support us. Um, plus, we're in the Inner Harbor, so we get a lot of visitors. You know, yeah. We were in some some back alley somewhere; we probably <laughs> wouldn't be getting the same support that we get. So, but that that's what it takes, and. Luckily, it's mostly just maintaining. A lot of this, especially the stuff down here, is, I mean, the stuff we're standing on, this is ballast. This is weight to help keep the ship upright. Okay. And if we were in service, we had like several tons of food and provisions down here. As we start eating through it, like this end of the ship would get lighter, so we could shift all this weight back here to keep the trim right. This is Civil War origin, because we can't really figure out how to get it out. And even, <laughs> if, even if we did want to get it out, we wouldn't, because we're, our draft right now is 12 feet. We're 12 feet into the water. To be seaworthy, we need to be 21. So if we come any higher out of the water, we'll just roll over onto the pier. So mm -hmm. we're keeping it here anyway. But all we have to do, well, every day when I do maintenance down here, I come down and I check the water height in the bilge to make sure we're not leaking too much. Everything else pretty much takes care of itself. It's pretty insulated down here. It's pretty well protected. So as long as like nobody comes down here smoking or something crazy with like fire, we're, we're okay. Yeah, that's yeah. great because you certainly hear about uh, the struggles that a lot of the museum ships have in the country from all different time periods and kind of yeah. maintaining that and uh, what, what goes into that. So yeah. it's, it's great that you know, you've kind of reached the point where uh, with just some regular maintenance, you're able to keep it going. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's things you do have to watch. I mean, I'm sort of simplifying it a little bit, but there's, <laughs> you know, one of the things they're worried about now is mealworms. There's some new species of mealworm coming down the coast from the north. And they're, when we were in dry dock, one of our board members is a, a state underwater archaeologist in charge of this for the state. And she was out of the dock checking it to make sure we didn't have any signs of those mealworms because they can get in and ruin the ship. But <clears throat> So you, we have to keep an eye on things mm -hmm. like that. But yeah, in terms of actual maintenance, like we, ideally we would dry dock her every five years. Ideally we do it about every 10 to 15 and it stays pretty stable. So like I guess that's mostly the top decks where the rainwater is getting to it that we have to constantly keep painting and repairing and you know, all this stuff down here. We don't really have to touch it too much. Another really cool thing that you guys do is uh, how much access you give to the public here. You know, all of the different decks and you're really letting someone, when they come and visit the ship, explore really the, the entirety of, of what it looks like. Yeah, it's, uh, it's one thing we like to pride ourselves on, no offense to Boston, but uh, that you can come all the way down inside yeah. the ship and see the whole thing. So and we, we try to open as much up as possible. Um, there's a couple things we have closed just because we use them for 
like machine spaces and whatnot. But um, yeah, we try to keep it as open as possible. And the foundation we work for is Living Classrooms Foundation, and we're, our slogan is learning by doing. So not only do we try to have people see the whole ship, but also be able to put your hands on things. It's, this is not a museum where you're going to be told, don't touch. And we want you to touch. We want you to see things. We want you to smell what it smells like down here. You can't smell it on video, but <laughs> it smells musty and old down here. So it's just something you can't really experience any other way. It's, a lot of museums are going digital now. They're putting all their collections so you can view them on the internet. I can't put what it feels like and smells like in here on the internet. So you have to come and check it out. And on this ship, you can come all the way to the bottom. One little interesting thing I'll just show you on the way out here. Um, I mentioned how long the ship was in service. So it's a wooden vessel, knock on wood. When you hear this, that's metal because this area was originally a bread room when the ship was um, first built. But then during World War II, when it became an office for Admiral Ingersoll and the Atlantic Fleet, they had, at that time, modern World War II Navy personnel living on board. His staff lived on board here and they installed in this space showers. So they have this metal, sheet metal bulkhead here put up to keep the steam down. And on the deck here, you can see this old 1940s era tile <laughs> here on the floor, on the deck. That was the bottom of the showers and they had the spigots up here. And so this was a shower space. It's now our fire room. So when we talk about preservation, this is one of the things hidden from public view, but we have this very complicated fire system and smoke detector to make sure that the ship is stable when we're not here. But yeah, just one of those things that gets left over and uh, becomes kind of like maritime archeology span almost or observational archeology. span Instead of having to dig it out of the ground, you just kind of look around at old footprints and things and see things. Yeah, really unique parts of the ship's yep. history. Yep. We're back outside now and you can see the ship behind us. So thank you for that incredible tour. If people are interested in coming and visiting this ship or any of the other historic ships here in Baltimore, what's the best place to find you guys online? Where do you stay the most active? Sure, so uh, we have our website, www.historicships.org. And that has all the information about all the ships in our fleet as long as, along with our calendar of events that we have going on. Um, so it's, we're going into summer now of 2024. So we'll have a couple of special programs and tours happening this summer. You can get information on there. We do have a, a Facebook page where we post, you know, just normal goings on and so you can keep up with what's actually actively happening on there as well. And then otherwise, this is very much a come and visit kind of place. So um, we're right here in Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We're surrounded by eateries and family activities, including this. So we encourage everybody to just come down and visit as often as you like and as often as you can. It's a fantastic location. We actually walked here from our hotel in the city this yeah. morning. So, I mean, you couldn't get, you know, a better placement here and just really easy to come and check out these ships. So thank you once again. This has been amazing. You're welcome.